All right, so here we are again, uh, continuing to ride the wave of wakefulness together. And uh, um, today I uh, wanted to just say a little bit about, a few words, about the position of no escape. Um, and no escape, uh, just as a reminder, is this sort of fourth position, number four, as you're coming off really the top of the mountain. Um, and, and I put it right there because that's the point at which on the wave you start to get a really sharp downward fall. <laughs> it's like you're kind of going off the cliff in a way. Um, and I, you know, this, this, this image of the wave, it kind of also um, reminds me a bit of the experience of hiking. Uh, and, and this is something I feel like almost everyone can relate to where you've been on a hike wh where there's some sort of incline, a steep, tough beginning incline, and then you get to the top and there's a beautiful vista. Um, when I lived in Colorado, we used to go to this uh, particular hike called Mount Sanitas uh, at least once a week when we lived there. And it was just like that. It was just like 45 minute slog. Uh, just, you know, wishing at times you were, you know, <laughs> that you were dead instead of walking up this mountain. And, you know, and, but at the end, you know, we always got there to the top. And, um, and it was just beautiful. Um, and so uh, th this path, in a way, reminds me of, of just that experience on a microcosmic level of hiking, of getting to the top. And, and then for me, it was always just this beautiful period up at the top of the mountain where we could, usually I was with friends or with Emily uh, and friends, and we would just sit and talk, we'd meditate, take the view in, you know, the other people would be up there enjoying themselves, almost always in a good mood. Um, people's dogs would be running around, you know, sniffing things and sniffing each other, as dogs do. And uh, it was just like, you know, this is it, this is heaven. You know, we're sitting over here on the top of this, of the, of the front range of the Rocky Mountains, viewing the plateau stretching endlessly out in front of us. Like there's, there's nothing better. You know, this moment is it. Um, and to me, that's, that's really kind of a good description also of the third position of always already at the top of the mountain. And I like this metaphor too, because I, I can kind of viscerally remember, and I suspect many people have the same kind of experience of coming off of the mountain. Um, of starting to kind of hike down. And, and for me, it, you know, it, it, it always starts in a particular moment. There is a thought that arises, right? Ah, I've got to, and then maybe some anxiety, ah, I've got to get home and take a shower, have some breakfast, get ready for work, do something. You know, there's always something that needs to be done. And so at some point we, we feel the pressure of what else needs to happen and, and we start to turn toward walking down. And, you know, for me, there, there can be, even in a simple hike, a feeling of grief, of sadness, of having to leave you know, this beautiful vista behind. And I think uh, the same is true with awakening, you know, that to leave our wakefulness behind, to leave the peak of our awakening, our great enlightenment, our Dai Kensho, as they say in Zen, to leave that behind, to actually let it go. That's a huge... Um, relinquishment uh, and, and, and a journey that I think does take usually many years. Um, and, and, and because of in this model, there's the ongoingness of the process. It's never ending too. But of course there, there are periods where it's like, we're more in this phase of this position of no escape. And then other times it's like, we're in a different position. And, um, the, no, the term no escape comes from Pema Chodron's writing and work. Um, she's got this lovely book. Um, um, many of you, I, I suspect, have heard of it called The Wisdom of No Escape. And I just love that title. This was written in the late 80s. Um, and in that book, I was kind of reviewing it in preparation for this week. Uh, she has a really interesting and cool description of meditation practice that I wanted to share here where she writes, meditation practice isn't about trying to throw ourselves away and become something better. 
it's about befriending who we already are. So befriending who we already are. And, you know, I've, I've sort of had to admit while I'm teaching and sharing this quote that there's part of me almost every time I share the quote in that last line in particular, I feel some part of me kind of clench and resist uh, that phrase. It's like befriending. It's about befriending who we already are because there's some part of me that perceives it as being a kind of cliche or hallmarky. Um, but I know also that there's a deep truth in it. And I think that's what uh, Pema is pointing to. So I pers- continue to persist <laughs> in sharing it. Um, and I love this first line in particular. Meditation practice isn't about trying to throw ourselves away and become something better. And I love the imagery of that too. It's like the somatic felt image sense of that. Like imagine trying to throw yourself away. Like what would it feel like to throw yourself away? Um, it it kind of reminds me of, of, of like pulling oneself up by your bootstraps. So it must be something similar to that where you <laughs> throwing yourself away and pulling up from your bootstraps. They both require, right. You to kind of, use yourself to move yourself somewhere else. And it's, it's just kind of like, wow, that's, that takes a lot of work. That's a lot of effort. That's a lot of energy to expend. Um, and it's painful and it's painful. Um, so, so here she's saying meditation practice isn't about trying to throw ourselves away and it's not about becoming something better. And I think this is really important. Um, but it's also important that we get clear on what is meant here because Uh, not trying to become something better is not the same as being resigned to our situation. Um, To me, there's a key distinction here, which is that when we're feeling a sense of lack at the base of our experience, you know, and that feels like the most true thing that there is something missing, truly lacking. Um, out of that lack and out of the kind of the anxiety or the reaction or the response to the, to the felt sense of lack, which for me, it originates in the body. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a feeling of groundlessness, the base of the spine that opens down. And then when there's a feeling of lack, it's like the, I feel this, the center of my being contract. Like there's some sort of contraction tightening um, and then awareness and attention kind of, leaves that area uh, and usually goes up into the thinking mind. Um, And here, I think when we recognize that there's lack present and then there's something acting out of that lack, that's to me what is being meant by trying to become something better. That's the self-improvement project. When it arises from lack, it's a problem. When there's a sense of okayness um, or acceptance or simply abundance of being, there's just this abundant beingness. Um, And lack isn't the core thing. There is just this open contact with our groundless nature, and that's present. Um, Then we can recognize, right, the things about ourselves that are broken, you could say, the broken aspects of the self, um, but not try to make that go away or think that we have to fix our brokenness, um, that our brokenness is somehow a problem. Ross Bulletter in his, um, book on Deng Shan's five ranks, he writes here about his, uh, the fourth rank, uh, which corresponds directly with this fourth position of no escape. And he writes, we forget about the sublime. We are oblivious to paradise. We encounter the broken world and our own brokenness. So we encounter the broken world and our own brokenness. Yeah, I mean, this is sobering to me. It's like, <laughs> um, this is the phase, again, after we've cro- crossed the crest of the mountain, after we've peaked, you know, this is the part of the journey where we're coming back into a view of life that's more on the ground, 
you know, it's starting to kind of, the ground is coming into focus. And, and I, this is why I think in No Escape, it's appropriate that it's kind of falling off of a cliff because that kind of sort of how it can feel at times is like, there's no ground. That's the whole, that's what's, that's what's seen in the third position always already. There's always already no ground. There's never been any ground in this situation uh, at, at, a, at a basic sensory level. And, and including on our conceptual level, because our, you know, our concepts are, have no ground. Therefore, our ideas have no ground, fundamentally. Uh, and yet, that's all we have. So it's kind of freaky to the only thing we have is groundless. <laughs> so do we really have anything at all? Um, and, and that's the, to me, that's the sobering realization of no escape. Uh, we don't really have anything all at all, but... Uh, and this is something funny that Chuggyam Trungpa once said in response to, to a question about rebirth. Someone asked him, well, Trungpa, you believe in rebirth. Uh, you seem to. What is it that's reborn? And, he, and his response was, your neuroses. <laughs> your neuroses is what's reborn. <laughs> so uh, strange that we're like having this experience of groundlessness and yet a bunch of what we're seeing in the position of no escape is our neuroses and it's the neuroses in response to its own to its own groundlessness its own brokenness and to the brokenness we see all around us reflected in the same human condition in the same situation um parker palmer uh quaker and author and uh, someone who's really dealt with the depths of dark to suicidal depression wrote Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. And, and for me, there's two key words in there. Uh, perfection on the, uh, is the first one. And I think that's a that's a big point in the in the in the position of no escape is that we're accept we're having to really and being kind of life is inviting us to accept our imperfections, you know, recognizing that there is this sort of simultaneous paradoxical, always already perfect, inherently perfect as it is ness about life, about experience, um, and. <laughs> okay i've talked about that part of the side enough and we're broken <laughs> but 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 here the invitation is to embrace the brokenness and i think that's the other key word embracing uh embracing experience embracing groundlessness can groundlessness can the groundless experience of our existence can we can there be an embrace of groundlessness Groundlessness embracing itself. Love, compassion. Um, Joseph Goldstein once said that for him, compassion is the movement of emptiness. That's what he learned in his decades of meditation. Um, so here I think the invitation of no escape is to develop compassion toward ourselves and the brokenness of the world. Um, this is, I think, why the Bodhisattva vow is so important when we look at integration and waking down. It's like this is where the Bodhisattva is born, in no escape. Because the Bodhisattva realizes their non-separateness from the rest of life and sees that we're all in this together. There's no escape. Unless we all could go together, there'd be, there would be no escape. Um, so that's why the Bodhisattva has this unfulfillable vow uh, of saving all beings, because there's no way that they're going to do that. But there's no way that they can just save themselves, because there is no independent self, um, and and that's and that's known at this position. It's known. <laughs>